but we're working in a different space, so the solutions turn out to be different, although the pain points are, 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 are come from the same, the same set of problems. So we, uh, we've been developing a new class of industrial robot, which is, is different from existing robots, that uh, ordinary people can interact with. Uh, we don't talk about having extensive training. We don't talk about getting uh, systems integrators uh, early in the, in the purchase cycle. We're thinking about uh, industrial robots as more like the iPhone and different from mainframes. Mainframes are still a good business, but we're not in the mainframe business. We're in the iPhone business. And I came to this through manufacturing. I've been manufacturing at iRobot, uh, which is a company I co-founded, manufactured uh, manufacture, uh, Roombas in China. This is a, uh, this is a robot uh, assembly line in China. Uh, people building robots by hand with hand tools. Um, very similar, uh, I mean, this, this is uh, uh, the same way stuff is made for Walmart, it's made by hand. Um, in February of this year, ABC Nightline uh, had a uh, piece on manufacturing the iPad, and they claim that the iPad is touched by 325 pairs of hands. I don't know whether that's true. That's, uh, that's the reporting of ABC Nightline. Uh, Terry Gow doesn't give away a lot of details uh, of, of how, how things are done in his factories. Um, but, you know, our stuff that we use, our everyday stuff, is largely still made by hand. All the stuff you buy, buy at Walmart is made by hand. And uh, we've been making stuff by hand in factories for over 230 years. We're still doing it the same way. How can that be? Um, and, and contrasting that, making, making stuff by hand, U.S. manufacturing productivity has, has been increasing for the last 60 years. It's been going up because of some of the things we saw in the previous session, uh, putting robots into factories, uh, putting automation into factories, putting all sorts of equipment into factories. Uh, U.S. manufacturing productivity has increased by 3.7% per year for, for 60 years, with almost flat employment. It's started to roll off recently. That's a pretty tremendous uh, increase in, in, in uh, productivity of anything that run, runs for 3.7% per year for 60 years. But how has it been achieved? It's been achieved by moving up the pyramid, the necessities to the luxuries, to the non-consumer stuff, where there's higher value add. That's where manufacturing has been successful. With automation and higher volume, lower quality, lower uh, price goods have, to a large extent, moved offshore. The by hand manufacturing has moved out of the U.S. So right after World War II, uh, it moved to Japan. As Japan's economy got back on its feet, productivity increased there, standard of living went up. It moved to South Korea. As as the, they did well there, it moved to Taiwan. Uh, after Taiwan, it started to move into southern China. And when I first started manufacturing uh, in southern China in, in the late 1990s, uh, I was an academic, I was late to manufacturing. Um, it was already, well, I, the first thing I was manufacturing were toys, and even in the late 1990s, China was too expensive to do the plush, to do the sewing. That had already moved down to Vietnam, and we see lots more low-end manufacturing move out of China into Vietnam. It's a continuous flow. But whoops, here we come, Thailand. Tremendous uh, industrialization over the last 30 years in the new, in the nation of Malaysia. We sort of run out of room to go to. So that that worried me. And uh, you can actually see the history of, of manufacturing and the hourly wages starts with Germany on the left, then France, United States, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Mexico, and then China. This is old data. It says 90 cents an hour. It's up to more like three dollars an hour now uh, because it continues to rise. So, what will it take to break out of making cheap stuff by hand? Um, and I think in the U.S. we've sort of made some mistakes or gotten a bit confused. We have advanced manufacturing programs, but that tends to be thought of as meaning manufacturing advanced stuff, like airplanes, like jet engines, which we're really good at. I was at a uh, uh, National Academies uh, study or a uh, uh, conference last year, sitting next to the former chairman of Intel, where we're talking about manu bringing manufacturing into the U.S., and he said, we have to find a way or a thing that we can manufacture and no one else in the world can manufacture, and that's how we make manufacturing strong in the U.S. Hmm. That worries me. You know, there's this uh, famous uh, um, graph that you can find on the Internet of the uh, 
uh, cost of a single jet airplane, a single fighter plane, and the U.S. defense budget, and they cross in the year 2054. We'll make one airplane in the U.S. Man, it's going to be expensive. Um, so I don't think that's how to make manufacturing strong in the U.S. I, I think you need to move down, and we've heard a little about moving down into food processing. Food processing has to happen in the U.S. largely because it doesn't make sense to do it somewhere else, so that has stayed in the U.S. But there's lots of reasons for wanting to manufacture in the U.S. Responsive short supply chains is one. Um, I, 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 I experienced at iRobot, we had to plan 30 weeks ahead of time uh, how many things we're going to build for Costco, how many things for Sears, how many things for Bed Bath & Beyond, how many things for linens and things. 30 weeks ahead of time, we had the, had the right pack out to it, and something went bankrupt while, while we had stuff on the ocean, none of some things. Um, it was mentioned earlier, innovation close to manufacturing is very good, because then, then you're the one who's still thinking about how to improve the product, rather than your outsourced manufacturing partners. Anyone who's manufacturing in China, I'm sure, has had the, the, uh, uh, to deal with intellectual property issues and avoiding higher transportation costs. So, People, I, I'm a robotics guy, how do we use robots in manufacturing? But, you know, robots in manufacturing have gone along a certain line for the last 51 years. First, industrial robots were Unimate, built by Unimation for universal automation. John Wilberger was the founder of that. First installed in the General Motors factory in New Jersey in 1961. And we're here in, uh, we're here in Pittsburgh. It was later bought, that company was bought by Westinghouse here in Pittsburgh, but then got sold to Kawasaki, moved offshore, as did all the other uh, U.S. Uh, uh, robot manufacturers, and just a few small ones who are based in the U.S. of that is, is here, uh, but there's not a lot of, uh, not a big volume. There's most of the uh, industrial robots are um, uh, um, uh, companies that have the headquarters outside of the United States. But back in 1961, computers were incredibly expensive. They filled the room. Um, couldn't have a computer controlling one of these robots in 1961. Sensors were incredibly expensive. So, industrial robots started out as repeating a set of thumb motions again and again. And then that was a hammer, so you built your line around making it a nail and that hammer could hit. And to a large extent, that's what we still do. Although we saw some, heard some, some things in the previous panel about putting sensors on board the robot as a recent innovation. So that's a recent sort of innovation. And putting more software into the robot is another innovation. But we also heard about making robots look like PLC devices, which is an old, old technology. So today's manufacturing robots are very similar to those ones from 1961, at least in principle of how you think about using them. They're engineered to be precise and repeatable, but they're not about adaptability, flexibility, and ease of use. And you have, you have heard about having systems integrated involved early on, having people in the factory, having retraining of the people. There's a lot of overhead to getting a robot into a factory. The robots of today are not like these devices. They're not about ease of use. If you're going to buy an iPhone, you don't think about getting a system integrator involved early on. That's all taken care of by someone else. And you don't have to worry about that. And you don't have to go through extensive retraining to use it. And I'm not saying that's not appropriate for, for those sorts of industrial robots. But what if we did have an iPhone? How do we, how do we get there? So today there are about 300,000 small manufacturing companies in the US. And very few of them have robots. Certainly it was a percent. Because there's so many barriers to entry. It, you have to do a lot before you get robots into your, into your, into your factory. And they, so they tend to make sense only for very long production runs. And a lot of small factories have production runs, runs that last an hour or two hours, and then they do something else. And if, if it's a multi-month integration time to get something in there, that doesn't make sense. You don't get the ROI. So, um, Mike, uh, we, we started uh, uh, Rethink to build Rethink Robotics to build industrial robots in 2008. It's a, it's a venture-backed uh, company. Uh, first product we announced on September 18th, and this is the first public unveiling of Baxter, our new robot. And uh, Mike Bunker there is going to go and power it up. Um, uh, we're just, get, just getting it, we're building these in the United States, um, and uh, shipping, just starting to ship them. We think 
think we're going to change robotics uh, by having robots in the sea to interact with uh, that are very low cost. This is a $22,000 robot, fully integrated, no systems integration, and that can go into a factory and be instantly useful. And we're hoping that this helps keep jobs from migrating overseas and strengthen manufacturing back in the US. And this robot doesn't do everything in manufacturing. It does not do everything. This robot is never going to build an iPhone. It's not going to build iPhones. We've had all sorts of people uh, come to us and say, well, surely it can steer my yacht. No, it's not going to steer your yacht. Uh, there's lots of things it doesn't do. Um, uh, it does pick up the tablecloth. <laughs> uh, so it's a, a behavior-based system. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, you program it by grabbing its arm. Can you just grab it, grab, grab the arm again? It goes into zero force mode, you move it around, you train it, you don't write programs for it, it has no sequential program at all. Uh, basically what you do, and, and Mike is going to do that. In fact, Mike, why don't you start, why don't you train it to do a, a blind pick and place? This is a blind pick and place to start with. He's just going to go in there, uh, uh, train it up. Uh, first off, it's not going to use any vision. It has cameras in both hands, it has a camera in the hand, it has two cameras in the body. Um, he's uh, moving it around. When he uh, opens the hand there, it infers, ah, that must be a put down. And so it said put down, nods its head, uh, uh, that it understands it. He, uh, he's now uh, got it uh, uh, blind, blind mode, so come over, pick up the subject, put it over there. Um, so, actually, why don't we, yeah, I'm going to walk over here as it does this. Um, and it's, it's very safe to interact with it. It feels forced to put it down, and then, you know, it, it just moves around. Um, it's safe to interact with. It's very different from a current industrial robot. Um, again, blind at this point. So it's going to pick up, and it's going to go put down over there, but it's got some common sense. So if there's nothing in its hand, Oh, I don't have to put down. I don't have anything in my hand. Come on. It comes down. There's nothing there. Oh, there's nothing there. Hmm, let me try that again. Um, so there's some basic common sense built into it. This all runs all the time. It's not that you have to write a program from scratch. Now, while I talk about uh, what else this robot can do, Mike is going to go and program it to... Uh, uh, do visual recognition of those objects, and he's going to do an area search. He's going to go in and, and edit the program. Um, oh, wow, I'm going fast. I'm just on fire here. <laughs> we'll have time for questions. Uh, um, so this is a new category in industrial robot. And by the way, this is going to be here for the next few days. You can go up and see, see the interface. Um, you, you can see up there, he's uh, out on the screen. It's got a view from the uh, camera. Uh, it's going to learn this object. Um, we try not to outsource hard engineering problems to the end user, so it's, uh, uh, he's just going to say, go learn this object, and it's, it's, I think that's what he's doing, I can't quite see where it is. He's going to say, go off and do it. But there's no integration, it's a complete system out of the box. Like an iPhone is a complete system out of the box. That's what we're trying to do here. There's no programming. You train the robot. There's a distinction between programming and training. He doesn't have to train it in order. He can, he can show the end of the task, first and then start a task later, and the robot infers what has to be to make the task work. So if someone is working with the robot and does half the task, the robot does the other half, which have a parts of it, because it's not a sequential training, it's not a sequential program. It's what you're trying to do with the objects in the task. Um, it's aware of its job and environment. You can see the, uh, actually you can see the yellow uh, lights there, it's aware of people around it. Um, uh, uh, it uh, recognizes certain objects in the environment, uh, conveyor belts uh, in software releases later next year, boxes, etc. It just knows about certain classes of things, and no safety cages. Just interact with the robot. Narrow the, narrow the footprint. Um, and lastly, we think of it as a platform like an iPhone. It's a hardware platform and the software that comes out. Software comes out on a regular basis and does more things. Is it uh, doing a, a vision-based pickup? I'm, I'm just going to let him, him, it go there, and it's going to go look for the object. I'm going to keep talking. So we are trying to position the robot in terms of the tasks it can do. 
it looks pretty sexy, so people tend to think it can do way more than it can, and I don't want to oversell it. It's got certain capabilities built in, but it can't do everything. Um, and uh, it is a low-cost robot, and uh, so there, there it just did a visual pick, uh, search for the object, and moved it. If it was on a conveyor, it would have picked it off the conveyor. It's a low-cost robot, and someone mentioned in the last session, uh, compu uh, computation can compensate for some mechanical shortcomings, and we certainly use forward models uh, to compensate for lower cost uh, uh, hardware than, uh, than otherwise. Mike, are you going to go off and why don't you train it to do put downs at multiple locations while I keep talking? So it's got error recovery at all levels built in. Oh, while you're there, why don't you, why don't you just try and smash the two arms together? Oh, yes. So he's going he's to grab one arm, grab the other arm, and they move around until they get close to each other. There's a force field around them. They will not let him collide. You can't poke your eye, its eyes out either. So it's aware of itself. Uh, and it, 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 uh, so if, if a person is training the robot to do a task, they don't have to say, oh, and by the way, don't let your arms collide. That stuff is built in at the low levels. So we try to build in the common error recovery and the common stuff at the low levels and optimize its performance in the expected cases but try to make it elegant when the unexpected occurs. And that's a, that's a design challenge. And, and that's the sort of challenge you see in something like an iPhone or something like an Android. And how you make it easy to use and do sensible things. Send email, man. Tell me if I'm um, your way. Use com computation as computation communication. So this built-in intelligence of the robot is, is letting it do uh, easy things easily. It's got this elementary common sense. So now, um, actually, who was in the last session? Oh, sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. You don't ask me a question. How high can your robot jump? <laughs> Zero inches. Zero inches, yes. But Honda just came out with a, their, their uh, uh, Asimo 2, and they're very proud that it can jump about three millimeters, I think. And uh, Mark Rabert's uh, Boston Dynamics. Uh, Company, has a robot that can jump, I think, 25 feet. It's the right metric for them, it's the wrong metric for you. And different sorts of robots need to be evaluated in different sorts of ways. So the, the robots in the previous session are about precision, repeatability, and speed. They're the metrics. They're the things you're going to look at to see how good is this robot. And it's uh, amazingly good. Amazingly good on these metrics. What you can measure, you can control. Our Metrics are different. Adaptability, flexibility, ease of use, safety, certainly, inexpensiveness, and throughput. Throughput's not unrelated to speed, but throughput involves the whole system's engineering to get a new task to happen. So if you're doing a, a repeated cycle very quickly, but it takes a couple of months to settle up, but you're only going to do it for an hour, the throughput number will be way down. So it's about doing something for a short period of time then doing something different to get the throughput. The throughput's the important number. Um, I'm just going to have a, uh, another video run here. Uh, I, I think, I think uh, Mike, did you just get it to go put down in different locations? Yep. Yeah. So here, we're, here I'm just going to show you, uh, uh, so you can see it a little better. better. And, and why don't we, uh, actually, why don't we stop the robot now? We can turn, bring the lights down so you can see the screen a little better. Um, uh, 